reading is coming from Romans chapter 8 verses 1 through I think 13 bear with me there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit for the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. 
For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the, from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. We're here to worship God. If you will, open your hearts and open your minds and join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful to know that your spirit intercedes with ours. You know our thoughts, our wishes, our hopes, our desires. I pray we realize how gracious, how, magni how magnificent you are. To honor you and glorify your name that you sent Christ to seek and save us. That you're the Lord, Master, and Ruler. Help us, Father, not to be led astray by Satan who sends all kind of deceptive things in us. A lot of people blame you for everything that's bad in the world without realizing the lust that's in men's heart, the greed, the envy, the jealousy, the backbiting. Help us realize the blood of Christ, the love and mercy that came through that gospel, his death and his resurrection for us. But we open our hearts, let the seed be planted deep, Bless those that prepared their children long before they got here. They didn't say, hurry up, we got to go to the church. They said, we have the opportunity to glorify God here at home and there. Be with us, guide us. May we give you the glory and honor and praise in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Oh, 
there was a terrible thunderstorm brewing late one night, and a father was afraid for his little girl that she might be fearful upstairs asleep in her bed, and maybe the storm had frightened her. So dad went over and he checked into her room, not afraid a bit. The little girl was standing at her bedroom window, looking out, enjoying the storm. And every time a big streak of lightning struck, she smiled real big and struck a pose. And he said, honey, what are you doing? He said, well, she says, well, hey, daddy, I think God's trying to take my picture. Not a bit afraid, just confident in the assurance that God was with her. Now, I wouldn't want any of us to live foolishly or presumptively. But my wish for you and me and all of us is that we could live with more confidence and certainty in our relationship with the Lord, if indeed we do have a right relationship with the Lord. And perhaps the most confidence-building chapter in all the Bible is Romans chapter 8. And today we're going to be studying the first 13 verses of Romans chapter 8. A lot of folks have described the 8th chapter of Romans as being the greatest of the entire letter. David Roper said that coming from chapter 7 to chapter 8 is like coming out of darkness into light. It's like traveling out of a blustery winter storm into a beautiful spring day. R.C. Bell said, if the book of Romans is a diamond ring, chapter 8 is the diamond in the center of the ring, and verse 28 is the sparkle in the diamond. I've heard it said that if Romans were the Himalayan mountain range, chapter 8 would be Mount Everest. I love Romans chapter 8. At, at one point, humanity was under law. But now, in Jesus Christ, we are released from the law. We have faith in Jesus Christ. We don't have to perfectly keep law our commandments because now we're under grace and we're released from the law's jurisdiction. And though we are guilty, we are pronounced not guilty. We are uncondemned in Jesus Christ despite the guilt of our sin. And that's what chapter 8 is all about. The quintessential verse in our study today is that first verse. I call it a Christian's Emancipation Proclamation. It is Paul the Christian proclaiming his freedom from the law and his freedom in Jesus Christ. We want to ask of verse 1 there, the Christian's emancipation or freedom proclamation, five simple questions. The who, what, where, when, and how questions. And the how one will have three answers to it, and then the lesson will be yours. But the first question we want to ask of this is what? Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I hope you picked up a sermon outline on your way in and that you'll fill in the blanks as the answers come your way. What is the essential substance of this Emancipation Proclamation? It is simply this, that there is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. If you are in Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation for your sin. Notice the word, therefore, there. One of Paul's favorite words, and, and you always want to ask yourself when you see therefore, what's it there for? It shows us that he is continuing the thought from the end of chapter 7 on into the beginning of chapter 8. Back in chapter 7, he had struggled or wrote about his struggles as a wretched man. The thing I hate and despise is what I often do. The thing that I should do, I sometimes fail to do. Oh, wretched man that I am. Paul's spiritual struggles. And we can identify with those struggles too. But he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he answers his own question. God will through Jesus Christ. So God through Christ delivers us from the law and from sin, and places us under grace. Therefore, there is no condemnation. The word that Paul wrote that's translated condemnation is katakrama. Katakrama means, according to Colin Cruz, a judicial pronouncement upon a guilty person. Hence the translation condemnation or punishment or penalty. 
But in Jesus Christ, though we are guilty, there's no penalty for our guilt. Not for us, because our sins were punished in Jesus Christ. Now notice, as we look at this this morning, we want to be sure that not only are we saying what Paul said, but that we're not saying something that he did not say. And a lot of our religious friends misunderstand and and think Paul's saying something that he is not at all saying. Notice that Paul does not say that there's no struggle because we all struggle from time to time to do right and avoid wrong. Notice that he is not saying that there is no failure because every one of us in here has failed and if, if we keep breathing much longer, we'll probably fail again. Notice that Paul does not say that there is no need for self-control. In 1 Corinthians 9, in verse 27, Paul said, I buffet or box my body every day and bring it under subjection, lest after I preach to others, I myself, a preacher, would become a castaway of the faith. And you better know, if the great man Paul had to stay on himself and discipline himself, I do, because I'm not half the man that the Apostle Paul was. So he's not saying any of those things. Notice also that what he, not only what he is not saying, but what he is saying. He is not saying that there is some condemnation. He is not saying that there's a little bit of condemnation. He is not saying that there's just the little bittiest, teenitiest condemnation. No. No. He says there is absolutely no condemnation. You know how much that is? That's zero. That's zilch, zilch, zip, nada. There is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. Raise your hand for me this morning if you are a parent. If you are a parent, raise your hand. Okay, thank you. Now, let's talk about your sons and daughters. Have they ever disobeyed you? Or did they ever disobey you? And did one or two of them ever commit? (laughs) She's still got her hand up over here, y'all. She's got three of them here seeing it too. Four of them. Five. You got a whole pew of people, don't you? And you know what? Was there one that ever pulled a whopper? I mean a big old disobedience. Let me ask you, did you quit loving them? Did you kick them out of the family? Disappointed, but still your child, right? Now raise your hand for me this morning if you had a parent. Anybody have a mom or dad? Come on now, that's everybody, right? So did you ever disobey? And did you, like me, ever commit a whopper of a disobedience? Did you ever set the bathroom on fire playing with matches? Did you ever flip and total out your dad's brand new pickup? I did. I did that. Let me ask you, did they disown you? Did they stop loving you? Disappointed, yeah. But I hope you had parents that loved you and you were still in the family. You were still their child. Well, folks, that's the way our Heavenly Father is. Our Heavenly Parent. He's made a way through Jesus Christ that though we are guilty of some whoppers, and if we're honest with ourselves... We are all guilty. But despite the guilt of our sin, God has made a way through Jesus Christ that we can still be His children and that despite our sin, there is no condemnation for us. That's the what of our lesson. Well, what about the who of our lesson? Who is this promise for? Notice that it's only for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's not for everybody. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Did you know that the Apostle Paul wrote the the phrase in Christ 164 times? In Christ, in his letters. In Paul's mind, there are only two groups of people. Those who are in Christ and saved, and those who are outside of Christ and thus lost. And Paul was clear in many places on how to get into Christ. Back in Romans chapter 6, He said, you identify with Christ, death, burial, and resurrection in your baptism. In Galatians 3, 26 and 27, remember now, Galatians is a baby Romans. 
Galatians is an, abri an abridged version of Romans. And in Galatians 3, 26 and 27, Paul said, You are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The way we get into Christ is by being baptized as a faith response to what Jesus did for us on the cross. If you've got faith, but you don't get baptized, you're not in Christ. If you get baptized, but it's not as a faith response, then you're not in Christ. But if you get baptized because of your faith in Christ, you are baptized into Christ, and now there is no condemnation for you because you are in Christ. Now, folks, if I were sitting here today and there was any doubt about whether I had been baptized into Christ, you know what I'd do? I'd remove all doubt. At the end of this lesson, I wouldn't wait any longer. I'd take care of that business today. But notice that Paul is not affirming, as some people say, the impossibility of apostasy. He is not denigrating the importance of regularity in church attendance because at the end of verse 1, he says not only for those who are in Christ, but not only must you be in Christ for there to be no condemnation for you, but you must also walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. You've got to stay in Christ and walk according to the Spirit. A person can fall out of Christ and they will if they walk according to the flesh. Walk means lifestyle. But if we maintain a lifestyle of following the Spirit and are in Christ, then there's no con condemnation for us. 1 Corinthians, 10, 20, or 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12, the Apostle Paul says, Wherefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And Hebrews 10 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but encouraging one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. We've got Christian duties to perform to walk in the Spirit and stay in Christ. But if we do that, then we have no condemnation. Now, I will freely admit that unless you've got King James or New King James, probably your translation does not have that second part of verse 1. And that's because it's not in the oldest manuscripts of Paul's letter to Rome. But it is in all the manuscripts of Romans in verse 4. Do you see that in verse 4? That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who, who do not walk according to the flesh, but what? But walk according to the Spirit. And so one way or another, it's in there. Look in verse 13. In verse 13, Paul says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, and if is the biggest little word in the English language, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live eternally. And so there is that requirement that we have to stay in Christ and walk according to the Spirit. So this is security, spiritual security but it's not unconditional. It is conditional security. We must be in Christ and keep walking according to the Spirit. Dr. Douglas Moo wrote about a time when he visited with a church leader who was known to be living in an adulterous relationship. Married to one woman, committing fornication with another. And when he confronted him about it, the church leader said, yes, it's true, but it's okay. Because in our church, we teach once saved, always saved perseverance of the saints, and the eternal security of our salvation in Christ. You see what happens when people start trying to teach something that Paul is not teaching? Paul's security spiritually, initially and continually, is conditional upon being in Christ and walking according to the Spirit, not the flesh. And Dr. Moo wrote that security without responsibility breeds passivity. Passive, passivity, and responsibility without security leads to anxiety. But in pointing out what it doesn't say, we don't need to overlook what it does say. Paul is talking about spiritual security in Jesus Christ. You don't have to wait till your deathbed, till your last day on earth, and wonder whether or not you're saved. 
you can know. If you're in Christ, if you receive scriptural baptism into Christ, and you, your lifestyle has been a lifestyle of following the Spirit, then you can know that when you draw your last breath, you will then immediately be ushered into the arms of the Lord. Look in verse 31. In verse 31, Paul says, If God be for us, who can stand against us? God's on your side. He's not hoping you'll mess up. He's not straining to hear or listen or see you sin so that He can strike you down with a streak of lightning. God's on your side. He's cheering for you. He's, he's hoping for your success. He sent His own Son so that you could succeed. He put His Holy Spirit within you to help you succeed. God's on your side. And then the fifth question that we want to ask of this, well, by the way, before we, before we get to that, how can I know if I'm walking according to the Spirit and not the flesh? Well, Paul answers that for us in Galatians 5. See the works of the flesh that are evident or manifest? If my lifestyle is characterized by any one of, or more of those, then I'm, at, I'm walking after the flesh. And I've fallen outside of Christ. And I can know I'm walking after the Spirit if the fruit of the Spirit, the description, the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit characterize my life, then I can know that I'm following after the Spirit. The third question we want to ask of the Christian's Emancipation Proclamation is when? And the, the answer is now. Now is a time word. Once we were under condemnation, but now we've been released from the law and we're under grace in Jesus Christ and there is no condemnation. We're not trying to be right by relying on our own strength to obey God's commandments. No, we're relying on God's grace to credit righteousness to our account. In John 3.18, the Bible says, whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. In Christ, there is no condemnation. The fourth question we ask of this is, why? And therefore, helps us answer or understand that. I bet you've never read a novel that when you opened up to page one, the first verse or the first word of the novel was therefore. That wouldn't make sense, would it? Because nothing's happened yet. It's the first sentence of the novel. Something's got to happen. Then say, therefore, this is going to happen. Well, what's happened so far in the letter to the Romans? Paul has said that all of us of accountable age are depraved sinners. Every one of us. There's none righteous. No, not one. But our faith has been seen by God and credited to our spiritual ledger as if it were righteousness. We've been justified by faith in Christ. The Holy Spirit has poured out the love of God into our hearts. Our old self died in the watery grave of baptism. And the wretched man that, that is trapped in a body of death will be delivered by God through Christ. And then when we're delivered from this fleshly body, we won't even have temptations anymore. So, how can that be? That is what it is. But how could it be? That's the final question. How could God make it so and not just overlook our sins? How could He acknowledge and punish our sins without us being condemned. How could all of this be true? There are three answers in the rest of the passage. First, there is no condemnation because Jesus died for them. Those who are in Christ, no condemnation for them because Jesus died for them. Verses 2 and following, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
There is the law of sin and death on one hand, and there's the law of the spirit of life in Christ on the other hand. And the law of sin and death pulls me down like the law of gravity pulls me down. But just like the law of aerodynamics and the principle of lift and thrust and drag can get a plane off the ground and fly through the air, as the laws of aerodynamics help me resist the law of gravity, so the law of the Spirit of life in Christ helps me resist the law of sin and death. And it's not that the law of sin and death doesn't exist. It still exists. Gravity still exists. While you're riding thousands of feet in the air in that plane, turn that plane's engines off, and you'll soon be aware of gravity. But the law of aerodynamics helps you resist the law of gravity, and the law of the Spirit of life in Christ helps us resist the law of sin and death. That helps us to understand the how. How could God make it so that despite my guilt, I am uncondemned in Jesus Christ? What the law could not do because of the weakness of flesh, God did by sending His own Son. The, the law is not the problem. The lawgiver is not the problem. We're the problem. We're the weakness of the flesh. Think about it like this. A coach is trying to put together a group of disinterested and distracted players to make a winning team. Or a talented musician is putting together a band of young people and none of the people in the band know music or care about music. Or a master craftsman is trying to build beautiful furniture and all he's got to work with is rotten wood. The weakness of the flesh is not a weakness of the law. The law of God is perfect. The weakness is in us. And the law could never achieve our ultimate righteousness and holiness. Not because it's weak, but because of the weakness of human flesh. So God had to find another way. And He made that way through Jesus Christ. And Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. That does not mean that Jesus was a sinner. But what it does mean is he, he came in the same kind of human flesh that you and I have to deal with. He was prone to the same temptations that you and I suffer. Yet He never gave in and He never sinned. And He showed in the very realm where humans are unsuccessful that He could be successful. And by perfectly keeping the law of God, He became our perfect Lamb of God without blemish or spot to die as atonement for our sins. God found a way to condemn my sin without condemning me. He condemned it in Jesus. And I got the justification. When Jesus came, He didn't come like Superman, some superhuman from another planet. Jesus came fully human. Fully human. I like Randy Travis's song, The Gift. In the chorus, he sings, He was the Son of God, sent to one and all, put on this earth to hang there on that cross, born to die so we could live. He had the birthday, and we got the gift. On our Savior's birthday, we got the gift. He fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law in us. The law still exists, but it was fulfilled in us. The condemnation, our condemnation, was in Him, in His flesh. But our sins were condemned or punished in His flesh so that in us, we didn't get the condemnation, but we instead got the fulfillment of the requirements of the law. So we are proclaimed uncondemned and righteous despite our sin. The condemnation that humanity's sin deserved was absorbed by the incarnate Christ when He died on the cross. The story, I took your place, has a fanciful element to it, but it makes a point nonetheless. One day a visitor drove up to visit a church he'd never visited before. He parked and got out, and a lady pulled up in a car and said, Hey, you, that's where I parked. You took my place. And he went on in and found a seat in a Bible school class, and a man came up to him and said, Hey, you, you're in my chair. That's, that's my seat. You took my place. After Bible class, he went into the auditorium, sat on a pew, and somebody came up and said, Hey, that's my seat. You took my place. 
And later on in the service, a, a man was leading in prayer and asking God to let the Spirit of Christ be within, be dwelling within the congregation. And all of a sudden, that visitor stood up and his appearance began to change. And horrible scars appeared on his head and his wrist and his sandaled feet. And somebody cried out, hey you, what happened to you? And he said, I took your place. Another reason or another way we can answer the how of our freedom proclamation is because the Holy Spirit lives in us. Beginning at verse 5, Paul writes, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Notice in this text that the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of God is the same Holy Spirit. And it speaks to the unity of the Trinity. They are one and the same. And notice the difference between being carnally minded and being spiritually minded. Fleshly minded, Versus spiritually minded. I love all of my brethren, all my brothers and sisters, in every every congregation I've worked with during the decades. But there's been an occasion or two where I wanted to pull my hair out over my brethren. See, I've already pulled a lot of it out already. And I hear all these sob stories, and please don't misunderstand me. I want to be there for you. And I want to hear, and I want to listen. If it helps you, to unburden yourself on me, I'm all ears. But every once in a while, for a few people, I want to just say, you've told me this sob story a dozen times already. And it would make tears come to a glass eye. And I just want to ask you, when are you going to grow up? You've been a Christian how many decades now? When are you going to mature in the faith and lean on God and trust in God? And and I don't make light of the problems that you're having, but I want to tell you, there's a billion people on this planet that don't know where their next meal's coming from and have never had a medication in their life because there's no pharmacy in their country. They're fortunate to have a missionary come and give them a bottle of Tylenol for the next tooth infection they have. And we live with all the blessings of living in a first world instead of a third world. we got so many blessings, and I know sometimes you've got problems and you've got concerns and you've got hurts, but that's what your faith is about. Don't put your mind on the flesh. Put your mind on the Spirit. Follow the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit live in you and feel alive, feel alive, feel alive, and let Him produce His work and His fruit within you. Be a child of God and act like a child of God. Be a spiritually minded person. And Then we answer the how of our emancipation proclamation with uh, this statement. God the Father will raise them from the dead just as He raised Jesus from the dead. Verse 10 and following, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in Christians. And we got the Holy Spirit as an indwelling entity at our baptism. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized and you get remission of sins, but you also get the Holy Spirit as a gift. The body is dead. If you look real close, you can almost see my body decaying right in front of you. And the 
body is dead to sin. But the Spirit in us, the Spirit of the Lord is alive. Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. John 10 and verse 10. Verses 12 and 13 serve as a fitting conclusion to this lesson. Therefore, there it is again. Therefore, because of everything we've said this morning, therefore, brethren, we are debtors. Everybody say amen. We are debtors. But we're not debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh. And then he doesn't complete the thought, but we can complete it for him. We are debtors to the Spirit to live according to the Spirit. So we cannot prevail upon the grace of God and wallow in our sins. We are indebted to the Spirit to live according to the Spirit. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die, spiritually die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Abundant living now and eternal life in heaven in the after a while. I used to go to Russia on mission trips. Putin won't let us in anymore. But there was a time several years ago when a lecturer in Moscow was trying to prove that Christianity is false and obsolete. And when he finished his lecture, he invited anyone in the audience to come up and take five minutes to refute his speech. And, and a common worker came up and he said, all right, sir, remember, just five minutes. He said, oh, I don't need much time at all. And that man stood up and faced the audience and he shouted a common greeting in Russia among Christians. And that is, Jesus Christ is risen. And then the whole audience shouted back. They stood and shouted the common response to that in Russia, and that is, He is risen indeed. Maybe we ought to try that this morning. Go up to somebody after the service, and when you say hello, say, Jesus Christ is risen. And see if they remember how to respond. He is risen indeed. He was pierced. He was truly dead with a spear into his pericardium area, most likely. He was not just in a coma and woke up. He was sealed behind a, a large, heavy stone in a tomb with soldiers guarding it. The enemies of Christ didn't steal his body. or They would have produced it to show, to show see, he was dead. But his friends and followers didn't do it either because they wouldn't have been willing to die for something they knew was a hoax. We stole his body. He's really dead. But they saw their family tortured. Their women and children tortured. And died themselves. Because they knew he was risen from the dead. They died for their faith. Jesus Christ is risen indeed. And if you are in Christ, there is now no condemnation. If you remain in Christ and walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. If there's any question about whether you've received scriptural baptism in Christ, we're inviting you to make your way down to the front during this next song. If you've been in Christ but you've wandered away, you can come back and confess and recommit today. So we invite you to come as well. We ask our fellows in the back to put up our invite song and PJ to come up and lead it. As we stand and sing, we invite you to come. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood.
Anna Orlando comes before us with a heavy heart. She says, I'm sorry that I've wandered away and uh, I need God. Uh, she is about to have to go it alone with just her and her children. She's got a long road ahead of her. So we want to keep her encouraged and in our prayers. And let's bow at this time. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for Anna and her tender heart. We pray that you'd draw her closer to Thee. We ask, Father, that You'd forgive her of having slipped and help her to be the person she wants to be. Help her and help all of us to always continue the struggle, to fight the good fight, and to keep putting one foot in front of the other until we've finished our course. And we pray, Father, that when we do, that there will be that crown of life awaiting us in heaven. We ask you to be with the current situation and Anna's family. Bless her husband and these children's father. We pray, Father, that you'd give him the strength to be what he needs to be and do what he needs to do. Father, help us all to encircle one another with the love of the church family. And we pray that you would wrap your arms of love and protection and strength around Anna and her family, and around all our church family, Father. Thank you for giving us your Son. Thank you for the opportunity, despite our sin, to be welcomed into fellowship and relationship with Jesus Christ, where there is no condemnation. Thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Is there anyone here that did not receive a communion cup and needs one at this time? All right. As we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, we're going to sing, Come Share the Lord. We gather here in Jesus' name. No one is a stranger here. 
Please bow with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord. We're so thankful for this opportunity that we can come together and assemble here today, Lord. Thankful for all of your many blessings, but Lord, we especially thank you for the sacrifice that was made on that cross. And Lord, through, through that sacrifice, we have the opportunity to look forward to a home with you in heaven forever. And Lord, I just pray that as we take this bread, which represents Christ's broken body on that cross, I pray that we will take it in a manner well-pleasing in your sight, and we will reflect back on its true meaning. It's all of these things we pray through your son's name we pray. So through your son's name, amen. Continuing our thanks, Lord, we come to you again. Lord, as we ready ourselves to take this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that was shed on that cross, Lord, blood from the, the perfect sacrifice, who was perfect in every way, Lord, and it was our sins that put him on that cross, and he died for us. Lord, I just again thank you for for. for that sacrifice and for his willingness to go, Lord, and I just pray that again we'll take this in a manner well pleasing in your sight. It's through your son's name we pray. Amen. Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we take this opportunity to give thanks for our offering. Uh, it's an opportunity that we have to give back a portion that was given to us. There are, are two opportunities. There's a box at the back of the auditorium, and there's also an option online to give for those uh, online with us. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, you give us so much. You give us so much, Lord, and, and not the least of which is, our, is the physical things that you give us, the way that we have to provide for ourselves and our families, Lord. And, Lord, we realize that everything we have is yours. And, Lord, we also realize that we have a responsibility to give back a portion of that so that your word and your love can be spread throughout this community, throughout this world. And, Lord, I just pray that you will be with those who utilize those funds to to spread your word and to do your work and your will. Lord, I pray that we'll give with a giving heart and not begrudgingly. And Lord, we just thank you so much for all that you do and all that you give. It's through your son's name we pray. Amen. The Stovall family also needs our support and encouragement. Baby Dorian will have a major stomach surgery, the first of two, on January the 17th. And then Marquez Stovall, his father, will have surgery for a brain tumor at Rapids Regional on January 23rd, just six days afterward. And he'll be in the ICU for a little while after that. Because of the tumor's location, they're only able to remove a part of it. So keep them in your prayers. Walter Holsenbach is still in room 218 at Encompass Health, and when his rehab is complete, he plans to go see an oncologist at the Lymphoma Center at MD Anderson. Derek Hudson is in the hospital in Shreveport, hopefully will come home this week. Deborah Snock, Joshua's mom, is right beside Walter in room 217 at Encompass Health, and Megan Snock broke her ankle, and when the swelling goes down, she'll be having surgery on that. Our ministry team leaders will meet this afternoon at 1 o'clock, and one thing they'll be doing is praying for our congregation, including all of you. If you've got any particular prayer requests for these fellows, please let them know. 
The Tuesday morning ladies Bible class will not brave the cold this week, but they do plan to resume meeting on January the 23rd. There is a men's fellowship breakfast coming up at LeCount, and you can get all the information about that on the bulletin board, R.C. Rhonda Walker, about that. If you would, let's stand for our closing song and for the closing prayer to follow. It may be in the valley where countless dangers are. It may be in the sunshine that I in peace abide. But this one thing I know, if it be dark or fair, if Jesus is with me, I'll go. Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Tis heaven to me, wherever I may be, if he is there. I count it a privilege, his cross to bear. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. It may be I must carry. Father, this morning we're thankful to you for the opportunity and the privilege that we've had to come into your house and to worship together this body of believers, to worship you in spirit and truth, and we pray that our minds and our hearts were open to the message, that we might be able to understand that it is only through you, through Christ, your Son, that we have the avenue of finding ourselves with no condemnation, and that is only through you. We pray that you would help to each of those present that have heard the message, that have not come to know you as their Savior, that they would commit their life and their soul to you, that they might realize that only through you that can they receive this hope that we share and this the eternal life and salvation that, uh, confessing their your name among men and believing on you to be buried with you in baptism and then to walk again in newness of life and continue that you would ask us to be able to look into your word for guidance strength and the things that we are confronted with in our daily lives that we might be able to overcome those things through your word and your example, that we might live a life that would show you Christ's image in our lives, that others may become interested and want to know more about you and your, your will. We pray that you would go with us this week as we go our respective way, that we would also continue to be a light and shining example to those around us that we come in contact with, that we work with, and we pray that you would be with those uh, of our number that are sick and those that are facing future and near surgeries, that the hands that uh, are facilitating these will be guided by your will. And they might be able to return to a better portion of health and be back with us. We ask these many things in Christ's name. Amen.